Today in the workshop, it's episode 13 of the Build a Real Robot series. We'll discuss the navigation sensor wiring today. I'll also show you how I'll use I2C in a noisy electrical environment. We're getting wired up today, so welcome to the workshop. Hello and welcome to the workshop and to episode number lucky 13 of our DB1 robot series, the Build a Real Robot series. And you will notice that I've got DB1 here on the workbench with me in uh, both pieces, the bottom piece and also the top tower, which isn't attached, but it's over here with us now. And the reason for having both of these pieces is the next step that we are going to be undertaking is installing navigation sensors. Now, if you recall the original DB1 diagram, the three different components of DB1 were the navigation unit on the bottom, the basin navigation unit, the intelligence unit, and the sensor or environmental sensor unit. And I don't want to confuse the sensors that we're working with right now with the ones on the environmental sensor unit. These are completely different sensors and are just used for navigation. Remember the basin this unit itself could be used as an independent unit without the other units and navigation sensors are essential so that we don't run into anything. Now I know there's a bit of confusion about what constitutes a navigation sensor and what constitutes a environmental sensor and so I've come up with a little bit of an analogy that might explain how we're working with these things. Now the only problem with my analogy is it uses the word navigation in the opposite context than what I'm using it in in DB1 but I think it's still a valid analogy so hear me out. My analogy is as follows. Let's say you're going on a road trip. The holidays are coming up, so if you're Canadian, you might want to drive over to Ottawa to celebrate Canada Day, or an American might want to drive to Washington, D.C. or Philadelphia for Independence Day. And let's say this is a place you've never been before, and you're going to go with someone else. So you divide your tasks up. One of you is the driver, and the other one is the navigator. Well, the navigator's job is to determine the route to where you're going. Let's say you're going to Philadelphia. Now, they may determine this by a number of criteria. Maybe you want to get there really fast, so you'll determine the most efficient route. Maybe you want to take a scenic route. Maybe there's a historical monument or someone you know who's a little bit off the road, but you could go and visit it on this trip. So the navigator is responsible for all of those decisions, how to get from A to B. The driver, on the other hand, does the driving. They don't worry about the navigation. They don't need to know that, you know, three hours from now you're going to be taking a turn onto another highway. The navigator knows that. They just accept commands from the navigator. Go over here, turn left at the next exit, etc., etc., and they do the driving. But it doesn't mean that they don't have to have any input. If a car comes into your lane, you need to know how to adjust for that situation. If there's an obstruction in the road, you need to know how to brake and how to adjust for it. Also, it's possible the navigator could give you a command that is completely impossible. Let's say the navigator says, turn left at the next intersection, and the next intersection is a one-way street, and turning left would put you right into the flow of traffic. Well, um, that is obviously going to cause an accident, so you would have to be able to say to the navigator, no, I can't follow that command, and then you'd probably pull over and figure out something else to do. Well, this analogy is to show how the base on DB1 interacts with the rest of DB1. The intelligence unit and DB1 is going to take input from the environmental sensors and it can tell the base okay we want to drive over to there. In this sense it's the navigator. The base on the other hand is a driver. It knows it's at point A and it needs to get to point B and the navigator is probably even told it what direction to go and so it just goes and faithfully follows that. 
But if something happens on the way, an obstruction that wasn't there before, let's say a door swings open or something in its path, the base unit needs to know enough to stop. So the sensors down on the base unit are sensors that are strictly for navigation. Now these aren't things like even the LiDAR sensors, because even though that may seem to be a navigation sensor, it's really a sensor on the sensor layer which determines the environment and determines where to travel and just tells the base unit where to travel. Remember, you can build these independently. You might only be building the base unit and therefore you might just be giving it some controls from a remote control or some pre-programmed controls, but the base unit still needs to know enough to stop if there's an emergency or an obstruction or to question a command like drive forward three meters when it can plainly see there's a wall one meter away. And so the sensors we have down here are strictly sensors that detect the position of other objects in rooms, things like ultrasonic sensors and infrared sensors, etc, etc. Okay, so now that we've discussed the difference between the sensors, we need to mount sensors for navigation. And that's why I've got the top unit over here, because Navigation sensors can't just be mounted down here on the base. I mean, you could sense a clear path ahead, but you could be sensing underneath the table, and the tabletop could very well come and hit the top of DB1. There may not be enough clearance. So we need sensors up over here, we need sensors on the side, and of course we need sensors down on the base. And that's why I've got it over here. And this brings up how are we going to connect our sensors? Well, the answer for most of these is going to be I2C. The I2C bus is an obvious way to do it. Many of our sensors are already I2C sensors, excuse me. Those that are not I2C sensors, we can easily create I2C sensors by putting something like an AT Mega 328 and attaching a number of different sensors up to it to make it a remote I2C sensing device. So we're going to use devices like this as our navigation sensor. But using ITC, I2C <laughs> is going to cause a couple of problems because I2C was never made for this purpose in the first place. And so that's what we really need to discuss today. So what are the issues with I2C? Well, as you recall, I2C was a system that was originally developed in order to allow integrated circuits to talk to each other. It's actually the inter-integrated circuit bus. Now, integrated circuits talking to each other were generally on a printed circuit board, and they were only a couple of centimeters apart. So the I2C signals never had to really run extra long distances. They also initially didn't run very fast. Well, we're now using I2C for a number of different purposes with microcontrollers and sensors, etc. But the protocol was never designed for that in the first place. Now, here's a little recap of how I2C works in case you don't really know. Now, I did a video on this uh, particular subject before, and this is just one of the stills from it. And it shows you the I2C bus, which basically has a clock line, that's the SCL line, a data line, and a ground, which isn't shown in this diagram, and a voltage. And the voltage is pulled up by a couple of resistors. And that's basically it. You can add as many devices onto the bus as you want to, as long as each slave device has its own unique address. Now, one of the problems with running longer I2C wires is that the signal will distort. The problem is the capacitance in the wire. The two wires being very close together exhibit a capacitance, and as the distance increases, the capacitance will increase. And this capacitance can cause signal distortion. Now here's a diagram that shows you the signal distortion. The initial signal is a nice square wave. But the signal on the other end of the wire, because the capacitance, actually has the beginning of it rounded off. You're actually creating what's called an RC filter with the pull-up resistor and the capacitance of the wire. Now this can cause pulses to be missed. It can also cause pulses to be delayed because they won't trigger until the voltage gets to a certain point. And it can cause erratic operation. So what can we do for that? Well, one thing we can do for that is convert the I2C signal into a balanced line. Now, balanced lines are used when we need to run 
long distances of cables and we don't want to pick up interference. The way they work is that instead of an unbalanced line, which uses a signal and a ground and the signal in reference to ground, a balanced line uses two wires that are a differential signal. And the signal we're transmitting is the difference in voltage between the two wires. So if interference is to happen, the two wires, since they're twisted together, are going to pick up the interference pretty well equally. And that will cancel out because it's looking for a different signal, not an equal signal. Balance lines are used in Ethernet connections. They're used in the public phone line. And the microphones I'm using here in the workshop to record this use balance lines for the audio. It's a very common method. Now here is a device from SparkFun, and it's based on the PCA9615 balance line driver. And it converts an I2C signal into a signal that can be sent down an Ethernet cable. Now this is a great device, and it'll certainly solve the problem. It'll also let you transmit the signal up to about 100 feet or so, which is much further than you could with basic I2C. However, the disadvantage of this is the cost. These devices go for about 20 US dollars a piece. And keep in mind, you need one on each end of the signal. And since I'm going to be sending at least three, maybe four separate I2C lines in DB1, I could end up needing about eight of these things. And that gets pretty expensive. It's also a bit of an overkill because DB1 is only a couple of feet tall. I don't need to drive the signal 100 feet or something. But if you're putting I2C sensors on the other side of the room and you want to wire them to a controller, this is a great solution. Now, another way of doing this is with a buffered driver. And now this is a chip from Texas Instruments and a number of other manufacturers called the P82B715. And it's an I2C bus driver. It sends a buffered signal out and receives it on the other end. Now, this is not a balanced signal, but this is a signal with a lot of strength to it that ends up resolving the issues with cable capacitance and so it can go fairly long distances. And this is an application note that shows how these actually work. <clears throat> now the thing I like about this is the cost. These can't drive it the same distance as a balanced line, but we don't need to. Again, DB1 is really not that big, and so I can't see driving more than a maximum of a meter of cable. And so this should be able to do the trick, and it's a lot less expensive. Now, another issue with I2C, again, because the protocol was never made for what we're using it for, is error checking. There is none. Now there's error checking on lots of protocols. For example, the TCP IP protocol we use on the internet divides the data into packets. And on each packet, it computes a little checksum. It's called a CRC or cyclic redundancy check. And that computed value is sent along with the packet. On the receive end, that is also computed again. They calculate the CRC. And if the two values do not match, then something went wrong with the data. It sends what's called a NAC or negative acknowledgement to the sender to say, hey, this didn't get here and correctly, please send it again. And this constant resending of data corrects the data. This does not exist in I2C because again, we never intended I2C to be running on all these huge distances and usually in a couple of centimeters of printed circuit board wiring, you aren't gonna get any data garbling. But it can happen with I2C. However, by using a balance line or a buffer, we should be able to reduce or eliminate this effect. So now that we've seen some of the considerations for doing the I2C wiring around the robot, what solution am I actually going to use with DB1? Well, I went through a couple of different thoughts, but I think what I'm going to use are the P82B715 chips. They're relatively inexpensive. I can get them in stock at DigiKey right now, and they're about $3 US a piece. And remember, I need one on each end of every I2C line, and I'll need multiple ones down by the Arduino over here. But they're relatively inexpensive for the distances that we're running. They certainly should be sufficient. Hopefully they won't draw too much current. However, I am open to debate about this as well. So if you want to get onto the forum and start debating the pluses and minuses of the I2C wiring, I'm definitely open to discussing it. Now, another thing I've got for the wiring I want to show you over here 
got a couple of things down here. This is something I rejected, first of all. This was the first idea I had for I2C, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a shield for the Arduino. Now, what's nice about this particular shield is it has four independent I2C buses, and also an output for the Arduino's own I2C bus. And these are independent buses. What I liked about that design was if something were to fail on one bus, the other ones would work. It also makes it possible to use two I2C sensors that have the same I2C address as long as they're on independent buses. I'm kind of going to reject this card for a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't want to stack yet another card onto the um, Arduino Mega over here because it's going to start getting kind of high up and if you remember when this is sitting over here we're going to come pretty close to the top so don't want to do that. It's also not the easiest card in the world to find although I purchased this about a year or so ago I've since found them to be very difficult to get. I don't want to build DB1 around parts that you can't procure yourself. So this one was eliminated, but I still will probably use it for some other projects. Now, what I've got over here is a couple of these aircraft connectors. Now, you remember I used a large aircraft connector down at the bottom for the power. These are smaller ones. I don't know if you can see, but probably not. I've got one mounted over here just as a test. What I really like about these ones is on the Actobotics channeling they fit right in the holes over here so that's beautiful and they've got equivalent connectors over here that mate with them. These are six conductor and the I2C is going to take at least two lines for SDA and SCL plus there is a power and a ground as well but also remember I want to be able to send an emergency stop interrupt out to my um, Arduino over here which in turn can go out to the motor controllers and the emergency stop interrupt is going to take another line as well so having six wires on the cable seemed ideal now speaking of cable I picked up some of this as well this is six conductor shielded cable and I figure by using shielded cable I could probably eliminate a lot of the potential for electrical noise. DB1 is going to be a very noisy environment electrically. Not only does it have two DC motors that are spinning around with brushes and everything that are going to create interference, but we've also got all sorts of processors on here. Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, probably a Jetson Nano, and maybe even something else on it for the intelligent level, maybe a few more Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. By the time you're finished, there's a lot of electrical noise, and so shielding the cable, I think, will really help. Now, of course, that does increase cable capacitance, but because I'll be using those driver chips and because of the distances I'm running, the longest one being up to the top of the tower here, I don't see that as being a problem. Okay. So that basically does it for today's discussion. Now, the next time we get together, we'll actually start mounting some of the sensors on. We'll start doing some of this wiring over here. Uh, the wiring's probably what we'll have in the next one. This is kind of a busy week for me, so I will try to get an episode out next week. But uh, it's my one annual vacation week, so I'm kind of half working and half going to the International Jazz Festival. So <laughs> my schedule's a bit kind of funny now, but... I assure you by later in July we'll be back on a regular track. Now, of course, uh, if you want more information, there are DB1 articles on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. While you're there, please sign up for the newsletter. But another thing and a very, very important way to communicate about DB1 are the new DroneBotWorkshop.com forums. Those are at forum.DroneBotWorkshop.com. There's also a link on the website to them. If you haven't joined the forum, please do. We're doing a lot of discussions about DB1 and robotics in general on the forum, and I would really love to see you there. So until I see you next time, please take care of yourselves, have fun working on your DB1s, and I hope to see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now.